we've come to the medications, all right? Sorry for the delay, but this is what, the, all the rest is really important, is the backdrop for this. This is the question of the day. Is the behavior that we are seeing likely to respond to a medication? Yes or no? If it is yes, then we go down that pathway. If it is no, we don't go down that pathway, okay? We don't wanna do that. So before I pick up the pen, before you type it in your computer and have the printer print it off, this is the question you want to have answered. These are the behaviors that are not likely to respond to medications. And we have to acknowledge that there are several of them. And this is on the algorithm as well. So that's what this part is, it's the algorithm. So wandering, okay? The dipsy doodling and even the pacers that, that leave the track in the linoleum. These folks, medications will not help them, okay? Vocally disruptive behaviors, hiding and hoarding. The folks who gather as they walk by, you know, they wander into people's rooms and gather other things. That's not gonna respond to medications. Repetitive activities, tapping, shaking, right, pulling, those don't respond. Inappropriate voiding, that's why clarity of where to void and signs and color contrast are important because that doesn't respond to medications. Dressing and undressing, nope. Tugging at seat belts or at the table restraints that some people may have. Eating inedible objects, right? No, nope, doesn't respond and resistiveness to care. And the caveat to that is certain behaviors may respond. The moderate to severe behaviors like slapping, kicking, hitting, biting may respond. And that's why the assessment is important. That's why we do the eco-biopsychosocial thing so that we can look at other avenues. But sometimes maybe we have to go down that road. Where do we go from here? These are the ones that may respond to medications. And so we look for a cluster of symptoms that may respond. Are there anxiety symptoms or a disorder contributing to the picture? Are there depressive symptoms? Is there the complete major depressive disorder syndrome? Absolutely. But still, are there significant depressive symptoms that may not meet DSM criteria, but are still persistent and problematic, and you still want to give it a try to treat them. Manic-like symptoms, delusions and hallucinations, physical and verbal aggression, absolutely, we can take a look at that. Sleep disturbance, like Carol was saying, sleep disorders, sleep problems as part of a syndrome. I know there's lots of pressure on the family docs to get people off of sleep medications. I get phone calls all the time. My answer to them is, is this part of a syndrome? Is this part of major depressive disorder? And we need to treat it because it's a symptom of an illness. And if we don't treat it, we actually increase the chance of resistance to treatment and relapse, okay? So it's not so black and white. We have to know the details. And sexually disinhibited behavior, that may also respond to medications. So we have to take a look at what those are. The first thing we have to talk about is consent. Can this person who I am speaking with, who has an issue, who I think has an illness that may respond to medications, can they consent? Okay, this should be for everybody all the time. You have to be able to look at the person and say, do I think they are capable of consenting to my treatment, investigation, plan, program, whatever it is? Because if they can't, you have to find who is the substitute decision maker, all right? If they can, great. You know, do they realize there's something going on? Can they understand it applies to them? Can you explain to them the pros and cons of the treatment, including what will happen if there isn't any treatment, okay? Can they communicate a desire based on their belief system, right? Those are the, you know, key things about consent. And if they can't, who do you go to? Who can give consent and please document that? Then you're going to identify that cluster of symptoms, anxiety, depression, psychosis, whichever one it is, and the algorithm will help direct you to, in the algorithm, you will find tables like this, okay? So this is the psychosis symptom cluster. The lovely thing about the drug tables under the hyperlink, 
okay, is that they will give you the medication and the initial starting dose and how often you need to give it and how it comes. So tablet, liquids, quick dissolve. What is the dose you start with? How quickly do you titrate? What is the average daily dose? Common side effects. And then, like I said, medication, how you can administer it with antipsychotics. You have to remember the black box warning. So, what is the goal of care? What would that person want if they were making the decision and are no longer able to? What is acceptable to family as part of that, but really what would the person want? And for lots of people, I, if I want my lady who sees the people, right, when you talk to her, she wants to stay at home because she loves to garden. In fact, she has this amazing garden. She is, doesn't want to leave her house, but these people are frightening her now, and she, now she sleeps on the couch because they're lying in her bed. And you know what? Four people in a bed is too many, so she's just going to sleep on the couch. So that is distressing for her, but she wants to stay in her house. So the family are going to need to make that decision about would we take that risk of her having some sort of event, okay, or even side effects, Parkinsonism, right, sedation, all the other ones, to see if we can have her less distressed in the house, okay? Gear, goals of care decision making. Okay, with all medications in geriatrics, you start low, you go slow, you want to have a good clinical trial. So you have to remember the physiology of geriatrics. When we're young, we have a lovely peak response to drugs. As we age, it, that peak flattens and it extends. So there are some people that need to lick the tablet and get a response, and there are some people that need more than the young folks, okay? So you start low, you go slow, but you keep going and you strive for clinical effect or side effects that get in the way, or you get to a dose that's good and you see if there's effect. And if there isn't, we take them off it. There's always drug specific precautions and you have to look those up. And uh, Carol always talks about having your own personal formulary. Please have your own personal formulary. Know a few really well. You do have to be cautious in renal and hepatic clients. Um, everyone is metabolized a little bit differently. In general, it's about 50%. Once you get to moderate to severe uh, uh, renal or hepatic impairment, you have to drop your doses. And then, just like we go slowly up, unless there's a significant side effect, you need to come slowly down, okay? Because you can actually create withdrawal syndromes on these medications, okay? So we never stop anything in psychiatry suddenly unless the risk of not stopping it is really <laughs> important. So every one of those syndromes has a drug table attached. Take a look at them. All the information is there.